Should you be fasting if you are trying to get pregnant? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford, a board certified fertility doctor. Today we are talking about fasting, your hormones, and what this means if you are trying to get pregnant. I know that fasting is a big buzzword. There is a lot of talk about metabolic health and I'm one of the people talking about it. But this is something that is flashy in headlines without many people giving you the opportunity to really understand the science behind it, but I know you're smart enough to understand it, so let's dive in. Before we do, a huge thanks for being here. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, leave your comments below, that's how we get ideas for future videos, and share with a friend if this is something you like. Also, you can pre-order my book, The Fertility Formula, which goes over this concept in detail and many others, talking about the intersection between your fertility, your hormonal health, and your lifestyle. It's on pre-order right now, and if you pre-order, you can get the pre-order bonus by going to nataliecrawfordmd.com slash book, get access to the Hormone Reset Guide, and our pre-release book club and IVF course. So go check it out. So if we're going to talk about fasting, one of the ways that it can be potentially beneficial is through something called insulin sensitivity. And in order to understand insulin, we also have to understand the hormonal system in general. So a very quick overview in the simplest way possible. I want you to remember that ovulation is not just something that happens from the ovary. It is really a brain ovary connection that allows you to ovulate. Inside the brain, there's two areas. There's the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And these two areas communicate with each other. I like to view the hypothalamus as the control center of the entire body. It is interpreting hormone signals from all over and deciding what to do and then telling the pituitary gland to send out subsequent hormones. And remember what hormones are. They are actually the communication system of our body. So they go in between because your brain can't really tell what is happening in other areas of your body. So hormones are essential for our body's function and for life. When it comes to the menstrual cycle, the brain sends out FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, which is a well-named hormone that communicates to the ovary to get a follicle to grow. As the follicle grows, it makes estrogen. This estrogen talks back to the brain, tells the brain a follicle is growing. When estrogen is high enough, then that is going to trigger the brain to send out a hormone called LH or luteinizing hormone, which allows that follicle to rupture, the egg to be released, and then the follicle to reform and become a corpus luteum. That corpus luteum makes progesterone. And if you do not get pregnant, the corpus luteum can only live for two weeks. It will then die, progesterone levels drop, and the process starts over. It's the simplest explanation of what is happening in a menstrual cycle with ovulation that we can think about. But what you heard is that the brain is both sending out signals and listening to hear signals come back from the ovary in order to determine what to do. And this process allows for room for error. And the brain is also getting other signals besides just what's happening from the ovary. So it is looking at your stress levels and other hormone signals coming in and deciding the state of your overall body and health and what it should do. So this is one hormonal system. A separate one is actually happening at the cellular level with the hormone called insulin. Insulin is a hormone that most people have heard about in context to diabetes, because in diabetes, your body doesn't make insulin well or doesn't respond to it well. So in type one diabetes, for example, the pancreas fails to make insulin and people have to give themselves insulin because it is truly essential for life. What does insulin do? I like to think about insulin as the gatekeeper in order to get glucose, which is the fuel or the energy of a cell into the cell. So my really terrible analogy is imagining that insulin is like a salesman knocking on your door, trying to get you to open the door. So it opens the door, allows glucose to go into the cell. The cell can use glucose and in normal, perfectly functioning cells, you eat food. Food gets broken down into glucose particles. Glucose is elevated in your bloodstream because you ate. That causes the pancreas to release insulin. This will then allow the cells to open up their doors, get glucose into the cell. Glucose levels then drop in the blood because it's in the cell. Insulin levels drop because it's not needed anymore. And you carry on with your life until you eat again. This process gets interrupted in a few different ways, largely through the food we eat, through chronic inflammation, and through constant eating. Because if you're constantly breaking down food and you're constantly having elevated glucose load, you are going to be constantly making insulin. And what does your cells do to this? Well, imagine if that salesman who's coming to your door is knocking on the door all the time. Knocking on the door all the time, you're going to stop answering the door. 
You're going to look out the window, say, I know who you are and I don't want any. And this is what happens to your cells. And this is called insulin resistance. And it can happen from a variety of things, including chronic stress, including being in a position where the foods that you're eating are causing inflammation, or they have a high glycemic load, which means they cause a greater response to your glucose values and a greater insulin release. So when this is happening, your cells get sick of seeing insulin. And then that salesman has to work even harder to get you to open the door. So now they're pounding on the door for you to finally open it. And this is your blood insulin levels getting higher and higher. This sets off a cascade of problems, meaning what happens then is your body kind of shifts how it's functioning. High insulin is very inflammatory. This contributes to worsening the pathway. It also causes you to store what's known as visceral fat or the fat kind of by your organs because your cells are not getting enough glucose. They're starved for glucose, yet there's lots of glucose circulating around, there's high insulin, and so it's getting shunted into a different place. So you're really becoming very metabolically unhealthy, and this is causing chronic inflammation. And what you may not know is that this is impacting your hormones and your fertility, because this is also feeding back to the brain. The hypothalamus is seeing this also, and it is saying, what is going on? Why do we have so much inflammation? Why are our blood insulin levels so high? What is going on? Why are our cells not getting enough glucose? And this by itself Insulin resistance can impact both how the ovary makes hormones, so the ovarian response can shift, cause the ovary to make more androgens or male hormones, be less responsive to the brain signals, but also impacts the brain, and the brain hears this and is going to start to change how it sends out signals. So we want to talk about your gut health and insulin and inflammation impacting your hormones and your ovulation this is such a good example to help you understand your entire body is connected. And it's really faulty of us and those of us in medicine are at fault for really acting like the body is in different areas because what you eat, the foods you put into your body, your cellular and your metabolic health absolutely is going to impact how your hormones are made, how your organs are going to respond to these signals, and ultimately your fertility. To take it one step further for your fertility, what we know is that at the ovarian level, women who had higher levels of insulin resistance, they have decreased metabolic function of their eggs, meaning even if they are younger, they're not as active, their mitochondria are not going to function as well. And also we see poor IVF outcomes, even in patients who do not have PCOS. Insulin resistance is often grouped together in PCOS and in you know, diabetes or prediabetes because it plays a huge role in those contexts but it also plays a big role in your overall health. And we've really allowed these to be segregated. Oh, you don't have PCOS, don't worry about this. But studies taking PCOS patients out of the mix have still shown that insulin resistance and chronic inflammation impact your fertility. Okay, what about fasting though? So the idea here is if you give yourself a break, right? If you don't have a glycemic load, if your body's not taking in food, suddenly what is going to happen is there's nothing for insulin to be sent out to respond to. Your glucose levels are going to lower, your insulin levels will lower. And this becomes a way to make your cells more what we call insulin sensitive. Well, another thing that starts to happen is that your body can then start to use some of the glucose that has been stored in other places during this time. And that can kind of help your cells become refreshed in how to respond to insulin. So when we talk about strategies to become more insulin sensitive, it's changing what you eat, when you eat it, and your behaviors. So things like increasing sleep and building more skeletal muscle, that can also be very impactful. But regardless of the foods you eat, simply the timing of foods can be impactful. So true fasting gives you prolonged periods of time. So this might be 24 hours or more where you're really not intaking food. And there's been a lot of chatter about this, especially because original studies looked at men only with this and saw that they might have some improved clarity, they might have improved function, and this might be a strategy to improve longevity by caloric restriction. But in women, this is not necessarily the exact same thing. And our bodies are meant to function different because in times of caloric restriction, one of my dear friends, Stacey Sims, rolls this back and says, let's really imagine that we have no food. We're in a hunter-gatherer society. Men now 
are not taking enough calories and they need to go and hunt food. So what needs to happen in their body is going to change versus if you were a woman, you need to not get pregnant if there is no food going around. And so in the woman, what starts to happen is the brain is not going to send out FSH and LH. You're not going to ovulate and your body's going to start to shift how it's functioning. So we do worry about prolonged caloric restriction causing both an increase in stress and what we call hypothalamic dysfunction, meaning that hypothalamus is now not going to want to respond because it's worried about you and it wants to protect you the most. And this is because the reproductive system for women is deeply connected to energy availability. And we know things like hypothalamic amenorrhea, the brain totally shutting off, can happen from over-exercising, chronic stress, chronic inflammation, low calorie intake. And this is because those GnRH pulses, the hormone going from the hypothalamus to talk to the pituitary gland, are highly sensitive to the full status of your body. However, time-restricted eating can be a little bit different, and I often view this as choosing the periods of the day that you are eating, and it's different than a true fasting intervals. This can mean not eating food in a 12-hour period. I don't usually recommend if you're trying to get pregnant going longer than 12 hours, but easiest to think about is what's happening outside. If it's dark outside, don't eat. If it's light outside, eat then. And ideally, trying to give yourself a period of stopping eating at least three hours before you go to bed. This is going to help your body naturally have some of that insulin sensitivity improve. It is going to improve your metabolic function, but it's not so much that's going to stress your body out. And if we jump back to women with PCOS, we know that time-restricted eating can improve both insulin sensitivity and decrease some of those androgen levels, which can help improve fertility, improve ovulation, and help you get pregnant. In my opinion, the best balance is aim for about 12 hours of not eating. So let's say 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I don't want you to eat very late at night. Try to stop about three hours before you're going to bed. And this is because naturally your body's not as insulin sensitive at this time. But don't skip breakfast. Breakfast is a really important meal. It can help when your cortisol is already really high in the morning, naturally to help you wake up. But we don't want to spike this and cause stress by being in a calorie-starved state. So instead of skipping breakfast and going all the way to lunch, think about giving yourself a really nice breakfast with protein, some healthy fats, and some carbohydrates to use right away. Remember that your body's priority is you, not you getting pregnant. And it will cut off other systems if it doesn't think you're taking care of yourself. So if you like doing longer fast, but you notice you're having spotting, uh, skipping periods, irregular cycles, a short luteal phase, fatigue, hair loss, anxiety, then maybe fasting or time-restricted eating is not for you. So I really like to refocus it and say, I don't love fasting. I don't love intermittent fasting for people, but I do think that time-restricted eating and having a 12-hour non-eating window can be hugely advantageous for your hormonal health and your fertility. And personally, this is what I do as well to stay my healthiest. Self. Okay, I hope this answered some of your burning questions about fasting. And if you have other questions, please leave them in the comments so we can address. As always, you can get more information on the As a Woman podcast, which is right here on this channel now. And you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or pre order the fertility formula. Thanks, friends.